Right, yes. Uh, today we're talking about media as a linkage institution of the United States, one of the four main linkage institutions in the United States. They connect the people's preferences with the government, but the media also acts as a way for which government can uh, communicate its message to the American people's way so, as well, so it's a two-way street. All right. Um, you should know that the evolution of our consumption, uh, our media consumption, has evolved over the years. Um, it used to be that Americans and politicians were highly dependent on print media, which are newspapers, in order to spread their message and in order to give people information. And this is the best way in which you can affect public opinion. During the times of the ratification debate, the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers were published in newspapers, and their goal was to affect public opinion in the United States. And that's how, for the 1700s and the 1800s, um, that's how politicians um, influenced public opinion in the United States, and how that's how people usually got their information about government and about politics through newspapers. But then in the 1900s, things changed, we've evolved, and we get the advent of mass media or mass communications. With the invention of television and radio, um, people are able to reach a wider audience now, and news and politicians adapted to that, and they're able to um, um, form their message in a way that would, can be delivered through the newspaper, I'm sorry, through TV and radio, and affect a lot of people, and hopefully change their opinion about something. Like an example, this would be FDR using his fireside chats on the radio, trying to reassure the American people through the Depression and through uh, World War II. And we get the Kennedy and Nixon debate. This is the first televised presidential debate in U.S. history. A lot of people that heard it on the radio thought that Nixon won, but people that heard it on, uh, that watched it on TV thought that um, Kennedy won because Nixon was sweating and he's stammering and he doesn't look as great as, as Kennedy. This is going to prove how important appearances are, how you look uh, when it comes to be, uh, presenting yourself on TV, which is going to be the main form of communication and the main source of information Americans will have for a while, for most of the 20th century and um, on to the 21st century as well. Um, this is where TV is going to be the main source of information for most Americans in the United States now. So you have the advent of TV news, um, again, main source of information. But the demand for news change, especially um, in the late 1900s, in the 1990s, and in the 1980s, all the way to the 2000s, people are demanding instantaneous news, news as it happens. Um, before, you have uh, for television shows like The Evening News with Walter Cockright, you need to wait sa at 7 p.m., you need to wait in the morning to hear that news. So people are demanding instantaneous news, news as it happened. So that's going to um, lead to the advent of cable news networks in the United States, 24-hour news networks in the United States like Fox News and MSNBC and CNN, and then later on, Internet and social media news um, later on as the internet become, uh, progresses and advances um, in the United States. So today, we want news and we want it right away and we can get that from the 24-hour news networks and we can get that uh, more commonly on the internet and social media as well. So today, a lot of people more and more are using social media and the internet as their main source of information. It's, it hasn't quite yet replaced TV news yet. Um, but as people start dying off, the older people who don't know how to use the internet start dying off and, and people start using the internet more and more, this is probably going to be the main source of information and will replace TV news as the main source of information for people. Uh, media plays a variety of roles as a linkage institution. They play the gatekeeping role. What that means is the media decides in this country what issues become important, what issues um, do people become aware of? This is called the gatekeeping or agenda setting function. The media decides which issues, if you have issue one, issue two, issue three, to bring um, the attention of the American people to, the, to bring the awareness of the American people to. And in consequence, the issues that the media choose to talk about are the ones that people see and are aware of and are the ones that people think are important. 
So if there's issue one, issue two, and issue three, if the media focuses a lot of its attention on issue two and cover issue two, but not really issue three or issue one, people are going to be more aware of issue two, and it's going to be more likely to be put on government's policy agenda and for government to address that issue. That's why this is called the agenda setting function also. So the media is the gatekeeper. They decide which issues are going to be talked about. And with that choice, they decide which issues are going to be important uh, to the American people, what the American people are going to be aware of, and which issues are going to be more likely to put on the government's agenda or the government's policy agenda, and which issues are going to be more likely to be addressed by the government. All right. Another function that media plays is the watchdog function. It is the media's uh, propensity to try to expose government corruption and ignorance and to hold our politicians accountable. Our media is usually referred to as the fourth estate um, because they hold the other three branches of government accountable for what they do with the watchdog function. They seek to expose corruption. This is usually done through investigative journalism, which is the use of detective-like skills to uncover government secrets, to uncover and expose government corruption in the United States. So some examples that we've covered in this class, Watergate, these two journalists right here brought down a president using, um, by doing their watchdog function, holding people accountable, looking for those government secrets and trying to expose them to the American people. It was the media that the people that exposed the Pentagon Papers and the Panama Papers turned to in order to expose the government to the American people, Edward Snowden as well. Um, the secrets that he found out about what the government is doing with our data, he turned to the media to um, expose that. So this is the watchdog function. They try to hold our politicians accountable. And as a result of the watchdog function, the trust of the American public uh, with our government has decreased over the years because they keep exposing government officials, they keep, say, they keep exposing lies and corruption in government. The public view of government has decreased and our trust of government has decreased over the years. Another function in the media plays, and this is a more negative one, this happens during election time, is horse race journalism. Media during um, election time, um, they, they like to cover who's winning and who's losing. They like to cover the game. They like to cover the race. Um, so they cover polls, they, co they, co they cover campaign strategies. This is where they, mo they mostly dedicate the air time on uh, and articles on who's winning or losing, who's up in the polls, who's down in the polls, who's falling behind. And as a result, they don't focus on the issues that matter for the American voters. They don't focus on the platforms of each one of the candidates and each one of the parties. Um, and the negative thing about this is when voters go out and vote, we are unable to accurately compare um, the platforms of each candidate and make a good decision because we weren't informed by our media. The electorate is less informed. We're not able to we don't know the platforms of the candidates. We show up in the voting booth um, unaware of the stances of each one of them. And elections turn into popularity contests. Um, voters tend to support people who are winning, people who are ahead in the polls. So media, by reporting who's ahead, who's behind, they're giving people momentum and they're killing momentum for other candidates, which can affect the outcome of the election. So instead of our elections being about the platforms and the qualifications of the candidates, it's now mostly about a popularity contest. Um, it's all about who's up in the polls and who's down in the polls. And this is... Um, one of the things that we talked about is class of bandwagon effect, how some people may support somebody just because he's popular. And the fact that the media likes to report on poll numbers and who's up and who's down, horse race journalism, um, can affect the outcome of an election. All right, so the nature of our democratic debates in the United States is affected by changes in the media. Today, there's more... There's a variety of media sources that people can turn to for information. You have traditional media like radio, newspapers, print news, uh, and, and radio and television. Um, but you also have the internet now. You have social media. You have um, online websites like the Huffington Post and Breitbart where you can turn to for information and sources of information. So there's a lot more voices heard. Um, in, the, in the United States today, more opinions that are represented because of the variety of, of sources um, that exist today. 
anybody can become a journalist by recording something on their phone so you can get information from a variety of sources now that the internet is such a big thing now but some people argue that even though we have more sources of information traditional media traditional media which is TV radio uh, and newspapers have become less and less diverse because most of TV radio and newspapers are owned by the same huge companies in the 1900s a lot of the a lot of these small-time newspapers and TV networks and radio networks were being gobbled up by larger and larger companies that today it is estimated that most TV networks and radio networks and newspapers um, are owned by the same six companies we call them giant media conglomerates and this may have a negative impact on our democracy because um, news is covered the same way now. Um, there's, a, um, there's a similarity to the way news is covered and there's a similarity to the way which information and which issues are being covered by the media today. So there's a decrease in traditional media anyway in the diversity of opinions that are being presented in traditional media. And today, huge corporations who own most of these local TV networks, local newspapers, and local radio shows can control information. They can control what information gets out to the American public. And with the control of that information, they may control opinions. They may control public opinions. And they can control elections and the policies that get created out of those opinions. So this is such a scary thing. You have a few companies dictating what information gets out to the American public. And with that power, they can dictate opinions in the United States. And um, with that, they can affect public policy. Um, I encourage you to go to that YouTube link and watch the video because it's something that I'm very much concerned about. Um, however, there is a um, pushback against this though. Um, now that more and more people, more and more Americans are relying on, on social media and less on traditional media like TV shows, radio, and newspapers, the power of these huge media conglomerates to dictate information is now decreasing. Because people, instead of turning to these forms of media, are now more and more reliant on websites, social media, Reddit, and all, uh, and all of that. It's giving these, these um, conglomerates, these giant conglomerates, less control. So that's a good thing. All right. You should know that our most media is profit driven. They need to earn profit and they do that by getting a large viewership um, and by selling ads. In order to sell ads, in order to get profit, they need a large viewership. So the problem with that is most media today, they define news as not what is important, what's going to help the American voter make a good decision in the voting booth, but they define news as what is entertaining. This is the bias of the media today. They thrive on conflict. They thrive on sensationalism, um, given a choice between story one and story two, story one being informational, being substantive, affecting, consequential, and story two being entertaining, they're always going to choose story two most often than not. This is uh, the example I gave in the class is Anthony Weiner's story, him sending nude pictures to people that are to women that are not his wife versus TPP, which is the trans partnership um, trade agreement that we have with other uh, with Asian countries in the Pacific. Um, the media chose to dedicate more of their time on the Anthony Weiner story because it is the entertaining one. Another way that this consumer driven media uh, has been affected is. A lot of news networks today, a lot of radio networks, and a lot of newspapers are um, tailor their programming and they tailor their articles and their information towards an ideological perspective or a view, or an ideological stand. So we have the rise in partisan media. So a lot of networks figured out, first one is Fox News, is we can grab a large viewership and get and therefore get a lot of ratings if we cater to one ideology because what in reality people don't want to hear the news people don't want to hear their new information because that new information may challenge their views what people really want 
is programming that reaffirms and confirms their viewpoints, that agrees with what they already believe in. So what Fox News did that was revolutionary is they catered towards conservatives. And as a result, their ratings go up, conservatives started watching them, they can charge more money for advertising, and most of the other networks, 24-hour news networks, MSNBC and CNN, copied that model. And these guys right now t uh, tailored their programming towards liberalism. Uh, Fox News tailored their pro programming towards conservatism because that's what works. That's what people want to do. They don't want to hear new information that may challenge what they already believe in. They want their views to be reaffirmed. You have even websites copy this model, Huffington Post, liberal um, website, um, Breitbart, conservative website. So this, you can see how that model affected Fox News ratings in the United States, only catering to conservatives, catering their, their programming to conservative viewers works because that's what people are naturally inclined to do. They want to watch things that agree or reaffirms their beliefs. And as a result, bad things are going to happen in the United States. We're not presented with facts. It's not objective anymore because they're tailoring it towards a certain viewpoint. It's an echo chamber now. We don't hear arguments from the other side or whatever arguments that we do hear. It's um, bad arguments. They're not the best form of the argument from the other side of the ideology. Um, liberals don't hear good conservative arguments. Conservatives don't hear good liberal arguments because they tend to... Um, these networks tend to demonize the other side. They tend to be overcritical of the other side. So we get less common ground. And as a result, um, people in the United States are being polarized. We are being divided more and more. Today, it is, um, according to the polls, we're more divided in terms of what we believe in, in terms of ideology, um, than ever before since the Civil War. That's how divided this country is in terms of um, ideological and political lines. And one of the reasons for this would be the media and the partisanship that exists in the media today. Because the media tailors its um, gears, its programming towards a certain audience. That's what happens today. So we have the polarization of the United States. All right, today, the internet and social media um, are, in the, are increasing in, in terms of sources of information. That's where a lot of people get their news from now, information. But the bad thing about this is they're not as well-sourced and they're not as well-researched as traditional media. And as a result, a lot of the information out there, especially in social media and on the internet, are not good information because unlike um, TV news and radio news and newspapers, they don't source those information very well and they do not w uh, research them very well. So this um, leads to a distrust in the media from the public because a lot of this information that we get from the internet, especially in social media websites, are bad information. And this, um, remember President Trump accuses the media of having fake news and this is one reason for that because a lot of people get their information from the internet from social media that are not well sourced that are not well established so the distrust in the media in the united states has been um increasing so you see here the trust in the media has been decreasing especially for younger um, people in the united states a couple of things um that you need to know for your tests um, if you compare stimulus one and stimulus two um, Stimulus 1 gives you the percentage of the U.S. House seats won by African Americans, and as you can see, it's going up. So more and more uh, percentage of U.S. House seats in the United States are being won by African Americans since the 60s. And you can see here the number of African Americans in the state legislators, in le legislatures, in the state congresses has also been increasing. But there's a problem with this one. The problem with this one is it doesn't give you the total number of legislators, so you don't know what um, percentage do African Americans make up in those state legislatures so it might seem like it's going up but that might be deceiving so for example right around in 1972 there's about 50 African Americans in state legislatures um, but that could be out of 100 so that means 50 percent of the state legislatures in the south um, are African Americans which is actually pretty good and over here, let's say that's 300 in 1992, but that could be out of 1,000. 
and that would only be 30%. So that would be worse in terms of African-American representation in Southern legislators than this one. But they don't give us that number. They don't give us the total number. They're only giving us the number of African-Americans. It would be better if they did it like this also, where they give us the percentage of African-Americans in the United States House of Representatives, um, if they did it here also. All right, hopefully um, you guys learned something. If you have any questions, please let me know.